Russia's potential nuclear strike are receding. U.S. urging Taiwan to follow Ukraine playbook. Hello, says Biden to North Korea's Kim. Canada and Germany hit by large-scale storm. Ukraine and Russia claim to be able to beat food crisis. Australian new premier promises consistency towards China. Japan turns away from post-World War II pacifism. No Taiwan at the launch of IPEF framework. Hello, I'm Johnny. Thank you for joining us on Funding News. It's May 23rd, Monday, and here are your top stories. According to the lead Russian investigator for the investigative Russian journalist group Bellingcat, Crystal Gurzev, Russia's top security officials think the war in Ukraine is lost. Some of them are looking for an opportunity to take their families out of Russia, or are looking for ways to transfer the accumulated money into dollars and euros. He said this is already a kind of betrayal by these people because they do not follow the ideological orders of the Kremlin, but are preparing for an alternative reality. The journalist said senior figures from the FSB security agency and the GRU military intelligence organization are preparing for life after Putin. He said one or more of the five hands needed to launch Russia's nuke could end up defying Putin. And this refusal will be the trigger, most likely a coup d'etat, because after refusing to comply with the order of the overlord, things will likely go downhill very quickly. If one person does not comply, Grozov said, this will be a signal of insubordination, which could lead to the death of Putin. Media reports US President Joe Biden is on his first trip as president to Asia. And U.S. officials are pushing Taiwan to reshape its military with a new look to Ukraine's success in fending off Russian forces as a blueprint for countering a Chinese attack. The U.S. Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Scott Barrier, noted in a recent hearing, small unit tactics, a non-commissioned officer corps, and effective training with the right weapon systems are important factors for asymmetric warfare. The U.S. Army urges Taiwan to buy an upgraded version of the howitzer in a letter addressed in March. And instead of purchasing Seahawk helicopters and early warning aircraft, the U.S. believes Taiwan should invest in a more mobile, cost-effective system such as stingers and javelins, as well as sea mines and coastal anti-ship missiles. Besides the weaponry, U.S. officials are urging Taipei to modernize its reserve institution and lay the groundwork for mobilizing the population in the event of an invasion. U.S. President Joe Biden on May 22nd had a simple message for North Korea's Kim Jong-un, hello period. Biden told reporters on the last day of his visit to South Korea. He was not concerned about new North Korean nuclear tests. He said on May 21st he was willing to talk with Kim if he thought it would lead to a serious breakthrough. When asked whether Biden was willing to take concrete steps to break the stalemate, a senior U.S. official said that the administration was looking for serious engagement, not grand gestures. North Korea has said the U.S. overture are insincere because Washington maintains hostile policies such as military drills and sanctions. A day earlier, Biden and new South Korean President Yoon suk yeol agreed to consider bigger military exercises and potentially deploying more nuclear-capable American weapons to the region in response to the North's weapons tests. A U.S. intelligence report suggests North Korea is preparing for a nuclear test while Biden visits South Korea. A thunderstorm with the power of a tornado rode through Ontario, Canada on May 21st, killing at least two people and leaving parts of Canada's most populous province without power. Ontario is home to nearly 40% of Canada's 38.2 million population. Hydro One, Ontario's largest utility set, over 340,000 customers were without power due to the severe storms. Environment Canada said wind gusts of 132 kilometers per hour were measured at the peak in some parts. A storm that swept across parts of Germany generated three tornadoes. One of them left a trail of destruction and more than 40 people injured in a western city on May 20th. The mayor of the city, Paderbaum, in North Rhine-Westphalia, said, As the tornado tore across the city's downtown area, 
Trees in a park and stop lights snapped like matches. Roofs were ripped off buildings and windows smashed. And the storm left a roughly 300 meter wide trail of destruction. Ukraine's President Zelensky said on May 21st, more weapons will allow Ukraine to win the fight against Russia to open ports and transport routes shut off by Russia, freeing Ukrainian exports of grain and other food supplies, and that food prices would ease. The UN World Food Program Executive Director David Beasley warned on May 19th that failing to open up ports in Ukraine means declaring war on global food security. In response, Zelensky urged allies for more weapons to defeat Russia. And the global food crisis. Following the appeal from UN food chief on May 20th, Russia's foreign minister said it will only consider opening up Ukraine's Black Sea port if sanctions against Russia are reviewed. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Rudenkov said that there are sanctions that have been imposed against Russia by the US and the EU that interferes with normal free trade, encompassing food products including wheat, fertilizers, and others. These are the reasons for the current food crisis. Australia's Prime Minister elect Anthony Albanese has said that he will be completely consistent with the current administration on Chinese strategic competition in the region. The center left Labour Party has described a new security pact with China and the Solomon Islands as Australia's worst foreign policy failure in the Pacific since World War II. The party proposed to establish a Pacific Defense School to train neighboring armies in response to China's potential military presence on the Solomon Islands, right on Australia's doorsteps. Media reported, Australia's newly elected Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, is a political figure of humble beginnings, being raised by his single mother on welfare in the inner Sydney suburbs. He is also a heroic figure in multicultural Australia, having said that he was the only candidate in the 121-year history of the Prime Minister's office to run with a non-Anglo-Celtic surname. In his election speech, he said that Senator Penny Wong would be the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Wong's father is Malaysian Chinese, and her mother is an Australian of European descent. A recent poll conducted by Asahi Shinbun and the University of Tokyo showed 64% of 3,000 people surveyed were in favor of Japan strengthening its defense capabilities, since China's expansion could eventually allow Beijing to control waterways in the South China Sea, threatening the free flow of trade. Japan could stretch the limits of the country's pacifist constitution to give Japan the capability to strike enemy bases. Following the war in Ukraine, Japan is exploring options to move away from its pacifist stance. CNN reported, in March, a Japanese delegation visited the Solomon Islands after China and Honiara signed a security pact that some feared could eventually see a Chinese military base in the Pacific. The diplomatic trip highlights Tokyo's interest in positioning itself as an alternative security provider. Japan wants to offer an alternative to China by showcasing its own quality infrastructure projects, which use local labor with high-quality controls and participating countries are not left with unaffordable debts. Japan's news agency Kyodo News reported on May 22nd that U.S. White House National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan said on Sunday, Taiwan will not be a part of the Indo-Pacific economic framework when the U.S. administration of President Joe Biden launches it as a key tool for regional engagement. Kyoto News said whether Taiwan will become a member of the IPEF framework has been drawing attention as the move will likely upset China. This framework will be launched on Monday. On Monday, Biden plans to roll out the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. However, a Japanese finance minister official said many countries in the Southeast Asian region are reluctant to join the IPEF launch ceremony because of the lack of practical incentive like tariffs reductions. Matthew Goodman, 
a trade expert at Washington Center for Strategic and International Studies, said. Eventually, the Biden administration is going to have to offer more tangible benefits if it wants to keep countries on board. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us on Funday News. Let's make every day a fun day. I'm Johnny Wu, your host. I'll see you next time.